Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Virtual Night Sky, our uh, May 19th edition, and uh, welcome to tonight's program. I want to introduce myself. I'm Rick Alling, and I am your, uh, your host tonight. Uh, I work at Arizona State University, the School of Earth and Space Exploration, and um, I, uh, uh, the, the room behind you right here is what we call the Marston Exploration Theater. We have been closed ever since the pandemic happened. Uh, the priority of our institution, of course, is, is teaching college students and research, and uh, we found a way through this virtual night sky to stay connected to our friends and stay connected to people that are interested in uh, learning about astronomy for and now an entire year. Tonight we're celebrating our one year anniversary. So uh, welcome and I'm glad you're here. We always know that we have new visitors and I want to welcome you to the program. We, always see, we also know that we have visitors that watch us every couple weeks and have uh, been, attended multi performances and presentations and uh, we want to welcome you back. Uh, in the in uh, the uh, webinar format that we use here, um, you will not be able to chat. So this is called a webinar, not a Zoom meeting. And that means that we uh, do expect to hear from you, but you're going to have to use the question and answer button. Uh, just kind of push that button, say what you want to say, uh, ask a question about the presentation or uh, or anything that's on your mind. And uh, there's a team of, uh, of people in the background that will answer your questions and we'll bring some of them forward to a little break so along the the way. I want to introduce the webmaster tonight he is Kim Baptista. She uh, handles all of your communications. She gets this thing organized uh, and she uh, uh, is the sort of at the at the the helm of the web uh, seminar for the web uh, webinar format tonight. And uh, so welcome Kim. Uh, Meg Hufford is my colleague. She and I do the outreach programming for the School of Earth and Space Exploration, the stuff that is on site. And, uh, and she is also here with us tonight. So she's she's watching. Um, the um, the we, uh, we have two students joining us tonight. Uh, that is Alex Blanche and Spruti, uh, and they have uh, Spruti Kachare. They have actually been with us for this entire year, and uh, I thank them for spending a year of programming with us. That's really amazing. So our anniversary started uh, May 23rd last year, and about every two weeks, and uh, we skipped a little bit about the holidays, but we've been going for a whole year, and, and now we're sort of catching up to the sky that we started talking about a year ago because of course it's seasonal of course it's annual but we started kind of slow there weren't very many people attending our program back then so i have no qualms about sort of re-reviewing some of the sky we talked about last May and making that a part of our program this May. So tonight we're going to spend a little time in the night sky. I'm going to show you some bright stars that you should look for and I'm going to indicate that these stars are probably your um, your your signpost to find your way around the night sky. And uh, we're also going to talk a little bit about planets. There are the all of the inner planets are above the horizon right at sunset. So I'm going to send you away from this webinar at eight o'clock with some things to go look for right at the western horizon and see if you can find find them. And then uh, we also have an eclipse coming up. I don't know if you know already, but one week from today on, uh, on May the 26th, there's a total eclipse of the moon and it'll be visible. There's a catch. It happens in the wee hours of the morning. So you have to get up about three and uh, see it before the sun rises at about five or uh, five thirty. So, uh, so, but we're going to get you up to date on that and then we'll go. And then I'm going to finish tonight's program with something special. First of all, it's a special night for two reasons. You'll find find out very quickly uh, uh, one of them. I'll just keep it a secret until uh, until you find out. But it, but uh, because it's our anniversary, I thought I would sort of finish tonight's program with a real kind of special, uh, kind of just, just a, a real short uh, slideshow, a little PowerPoint presentation about ways that we can engage and stay connected to the night sky. I call it the five things. And so, so uh, let's get started. I'm going to uh, uh, show you, I'm gonna use this particular computer right here. It's a little laptop. And one of the things I like to do is uh, use a, a program in here uh, called Sky Safari. And we've shown you this before. If you've been with us before for a little bit, you're gonna find out that this is pretty familiar to you. <clears throat> Sorry, it just takes a, a little blast to get it going here. There you go. So now you should see a, a little program on your screen here and I'm gonna zoom out a little bit so we can kind of just sort of see what's going on in the whole sky. 
um, just to orient you a little bit, what, what you're looking at here is everything within that circle, everything that is not green is part of your night sky tonight. And I've organized us for tonight at eight o'clock. And so the sun will be gone by then. It will be dark by then. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the twilights tonight too and how that works. Uh, so this is gonna engage you in things to go look for starting tonight, right after the program. Like I said before, I'm gonna send you right out and uh, see if you can start start poking around the night sky and see what's going on. So as I, as I move through this, you can see that uh, uh, everything that is in the green at eight o'clock tonight will be below the horizon. Everything that is not in the green is uh, stuff that you can see. And I just want you to focus for a moment on the bright things, because tonight is about uh, kind of not the details, not the stuff that is very difficult to see from the Phoenix area, but the bright things and uh, how to find them and how to use them to find your way around. So I'm going to start with um, this little area right here. So let's see, I am looking, let me just orient so you sort of see where we are. I'm, I'm, I'm looking kind of due north in the night sky right here. And you can see, uh, I'll draw on the screen here so you can see this a little bit better, but this of course is the Big Dipper. This time of year in the evening, the Big Dipper is really, really bright in the evening sky. Uh, it's, just, it's just right up there, it's as high as it gets. And we've talked about this before during our lectures and during our seminars that uh, this part of the sky is what we call circumpolar. That means they never really set the, the stars and the things that are in this part of the sky just go around in a big circle. The Big Dipper is really high right now. Kind of think about it like a Ferris wheel. It's way over the top. It will swing down uh, in this particular direction. I guess I can draw that. So it'll swing down in this direction and just graze across the northern horizon horizon there for a moment and then sort of end up back here tomorrow night at about the same time. The Big Dipper is easy to find. It's seven stars um, and everybody knows it. And so that's, so that's kind of it. Um, the, the, um, the one key factor of the, of just to remind you, these two stars at the end of the Dipper Bowl right here are called Mirac and Doobie. And if you line those up and sort of follow them through the sky pointing in this direction, they're called the pointer stars for good reason, because they point to a very single star called the uh, called Polaris, Polaris, the North Star. Uh, it's the uh, most northern, uh, it's, it's, it's directly north from any view in the northern hemisphere. And so that's, that's good to know. And to notice that it's at the center of my circle. So the Big Dipper is gonna just do this big circle and go around the North Star. The Polaris, the North Star, is also sort of attached to a smaller little asterism here called the Little Dipper. And so those two uh, just kind of mark your northern horizon. The Big Dipper is also not only a good way to find the way north, but it is also a way to sort of like start activating and start finding uh, some other parts of the sky. So I'm going to sort of do another quick little screenshot here. Oops, didn't do it that way. And so here again, here it is again, here's the Big Dipper. Seven stars, a bowl and a handle. If you go this direction where we're headed towards Polaris, if we go this direction, we're headed towards another star called Arcturus. In the planetarium business, we say we arc to Arcturus. And then if you continue on, just kind of keep that same arc going, there's another bright star and down over here, and that's called Spica. And so this is a really, really good way to start to start a journey around the sky. And this is eight o'clock tonight. And this would be a really good, really easy exercise for you to do. If you want to just get out there and check this out, find the Big Deeper Dipper, find the arc of that handle, uh, make your way to the star called Arcturus, this one right here and then continue on your way to the star called Spica right here. Uh, these two stars are very important to us for very, very good reason. I'm going to, let me just sort of delete this screenshot for a second. Just show you something else going on here. I'm gonna concentrate on that area if I can going to concentrate on this area of the sky. So now I'm kind of looking a little bit towards the east. 
screenshot again. So here again, now I'm facing the east. Here's that dipper. You've now you're following the handle down here to Arcturus. You're following the other, you're continuing on to Spica. Spica is part of a constellation uh, called Virgo. Virgo is one of the constellations of the uh, of the zodiac. And so once you have found Spica, you're also starting to find your way around um, the zodiac signs altogether. So here is uh, Virgo. I sort of drew it as a big, huge stick thing, but she's got an arm going this way. Spica means ear of wheat. So she's always holding a little ear of wheat in her hand. That's kind of important historically. Uh, and then uh, up above Spica over here is this big, huge lion shaped figure. This is Leo the lion. And you're starting to get this idea that you're sort of getting into the zodiac here. Just below uh, Virgo is Libra, the scales. And so if you sort of just now just trace a line right through these three objects, you're finding a line that will connect all 12 constellations of the zodiac. And so I've said this before in our programming, at any given time, at any given night, there are uh, uh, six of the 12 are visible to you uh, from horizon to horizon. And, and it changes every month, every season. These are different constellations that are visible to you, but these are, are good ones to find for sure. I wanted to just show you one more thing about uh, Bootes or, or about Arcturus. It is the anchor star of a constellation called Bootes. And Bootes was won his place in the sky because he invented the plow. So you have the ear of wheat over here in Virgo. And, and in mythology, Virgo is associated with Demeter. Demeter was the goddess of growing things, was the goddess of wheat, was the goddess of fertility, was the goddess of those kinds of things that happen in this particular season. And that's why she's in the sky right now. But Otis won his place in the sky for inventing the plow. He is the thought to be the originator of agriculture. First time you till the soil, first time you plant seeds, the first time you can grow enough uh, food on your own to, to start a civilization. And this is all meaningful because this all dates back to the Eastern Mediterranean cultures of Babylon, Assyria, and all of those, really those very, very first civilizations where uh, agriculture was springing into existence, these particular constellations carried forward all the way to today still have meaning. So Bootes rises uh, in the evening sky. He becomes, he just sort of appears in the sky uh, somewhere around March and April. And that's, that's when we go about planting things. During uh, May, June, July, August, September, he'll travel across the sky. You'll sort of be able to watch him all the way through the summer. He'll get a little higher or further away from the east, then starts heading towards the west. And by about September or October, he will set in the other part of the sky. And that is seasonal, right? That means that he's gone through the entire cycle of tilling the soil and planting your crops and moving across the sky and setting when it's time to harvest your crops and bring everything in for the winter. And so these two constellations are fairly easy to find in your night sky, even in Phoenix, even in the skies that we have. And so I'm going to invite you to sort of start doing that. Uh, and tonight would be a good night to start. So find the Big Dipper, Arc to Arcturus, and you have found essentially the feet of Bootes, Spike to Spica, and you have found the ear of wheat and uh, the hand of uh, Virgo uh, and its association with Demeter, the goddess of fertility and the goddess of growing things, the goddess of the harvest. Um, if you go in either direction from Virgo up from the east and towards the west or towards the east or towards the west, you'll find other constellations of the zodiac. So uh, Libra is just starting to appear in our sky. Uh, 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 Leo is high overhead and the moon tonight, uh, it's a half moon, it'll be right in the heart of Leo tonight. So if you want to want to find that. Um, there's more to see. I've got one more thing to kind of show you or some other things to show you. Um, once you have found Virgo, I just want to show you this part of the sky. I'm now looking towards the south. 
Um, another screenshot real quick. So here's Arcturus. We already talked about that. Here's Spica. We already talked about this. But uh, another little bit of a challenge, I'm going to call this a B-rated challenge. Uh, Spica and Arcturus are very easy to see, but there's a little sort of trapezoidal shape right here. And it's all four to five fairly bright stars. It's a constellation called Corvus. Corvus is a crow. And I wanted to tell you a little story about this particular crow. But before I do, let me introduce you to some other constellations. Right next to Corvus is a very difficult constellation to find in your Phoenix skies. So I'm kind of counting on you guys to kind of go camping sometime this summer or get up into the mountains to get away from the Phoenix lights, because I want you to sort of like sort of if you can find these if you can. Corvus, fairly easy. It's a, it's a crow. I'm not going to try to draw a crow. Oops, I'm trying to draw a crow. We'll sort of see if I can make that happen. And then uh, next to it is a constellation called Crater. A crater is a cup. These constellations are riding kind of on the back of a really long constellation called Hydra. Now, if you were with us two weeks ago, you remember I did a program about Hercules. We talked a lot about Hercules. We talked a lot about his labors. And one of the labors, the second one, in fact, was to find this sea snake and multi-headed snake and slay it. And, uh, and that was his task, task number two. Well, he did that with the help of a nephew and they managed to slay this thing. But this particular water snake also became important later because he was able to uh, sort of open it up and out of the gall of this particular snake, he was able to extract the toxins and the poison to make his poison tip arrows that helped him with the rest of his tasks. So this is all kind of tied to this old, old mythology. Another story about the crow and the cup. Some stories have it that this isn't a water snake, but it's a little bit of a river. And one day, Apollo, the god Apollo, asked the crow to take a cup, go down to this river, and bring him a fresh, cool cup of water. So that's his assignment. Here is the cup. Go down there. Get me a fresh drink of water. When the crow arrived on the bank of this river, there was a plant growing on the other side, and it was just kind of hanging over the river, and there were these berries that were almost ripe. The crow knew that if he waited just long enough, these berries would become ripe. Remember, this is about agriculture. This is about growing things, right? This is about that season where things ripen and do that. that. And so, so, he said, so he sat there and he waited. And he waited and he waited and he waited for these berries to get ripe. And Apollo got angrier and angrier and angrier as, as he was waiting for his cup of water. So when the crow finally sort of got his berries and finally went back and delivered the water, uh, by that time Apollo had, it wasn't going to have it anymore. He sent both the crow and the crater to sit down in this particular part of the, uh, of the sky apart from each other along this undulating river and the crow had to stare at this water for the rest of eternity because uh, he was uh, he, he did not do the assignment like Apollo wanted him to do. These kind of stories uh, date back thousands and thousands of years. And so it's really fun to sort of think that you can find these stars, you can find these associations in the sky, and then you can go read about these things. So you don't have to listen to me in a webinar tell you about this. You can yourself find the resources, find the guidebooks, find the things that help to talk about this particular, uh, these particular stories in the sky. So here's one associated with this time of year in the southern southern part of the sky, these particular stars aren't up for very long. They're uh, sort of, they, they're only with us for a couple of months. So this is a really, really good place to start. You're going to start with the Big Dipper. You're going to head for Arcturus, an orangish kind of star. That's going to be a star at the base of Bootes. You're going to head down to a bluish, very bright bluish star. That's going to be Spica, the ear of wheat in the hands of Virgo, the constellation. And then right next to that, a little trapezoidal uh, a shape. And that's going be Corvus. It's going to be a big challenge to see that cup or the crater because it just it's made up of fairly dim stars. But it is something so you should understand where it is and try to find it if you get out of the city lights and up into the mountains sometime during the summer. That would be great. All right, there are some things to look for. And now I'm going to kind of go back. I'm going to look at the western part of the sky because there's still some really cool action over here. 
In a couple moments, we're going to take a break. We're going to do some polling. We're going to be some questions. And when we come back after that, I'm going to give you sort of a solar system view. We're going to be in a different program. We're going to be out in space and we're going to be looking at the solar system from, from space. But I wanted to show you in this particular case, let me screenshot again. Uh, these are the planets that are up right now and visible in the night sky. So Venus and Mercury and Mars are all towards the west and they're all here. And this again is at eight o'clock tonight. So this is really part of what we're gonna do is we're gonna finish this program. We'll wrap up as close to eight as we can. And then I really expect it, if you can, it's a clear night. I don't see any clouds in the evening sky. Uh, you should be able to go out and see this. I wanted to talk a little bit about twilight. So you can see here where the horizon is and you can see how far the sun is below the horizon. I don't know if you know this or not, but there are three twilights that happen every night. So from sunset until the time that the sun is six degrees below the horizon is what we call civil twilight. So things are starting to get dark, but the sky is still fairly bright blue. This is when we're going to have our beautiful sunsets. This is where all that stuff is going to happen. But shortly after, it takes about 20 to 30 minutes for the sun to travel down below the horizon. Once it is six degrees below the horizon, that is the end of what we call civil twilight. That's what I'm showing you here. At eight o'clock tonight, civil twilight will be um, it will will be happening. The sun will be about six degrees below the horizon. That should be low enough for you to see these planets. And especially what to look for tonight is Venus because it's really a very very bright object just above where the sun set. And then look over this direction towards this one. Sirius is the brightest star in the night sky. And over the last several months, we've talked a lot about these bright stars. We talked a lot about Betelgeuse. We talked a lot about Sirius, Procyon, uh, Castor, and Pollux are the twins. All of them sort of are, are here, but they're all moving into the sunset. It's just the, the last periods we're going to see these things. Venus, Sirius probably will not be visible in a week or two. So see if you can find the two. Venus a little bit um, north of west, Sirius a little bit south of west, and that will be done. Just one more thing about twilights. When the sun gets to be about 12 degrees below the horizon, that's what we call nautical twilight. And what that means is if you're a ship at sea, that's the part where you start to lose the thread of the horizon. When the sea and the sky don't have a difference anymore, they're about the same. So it's darker than a civil twilight. It's that point where the dark sort of takes over and you lose a shipping, uh, you, you lose a horizon if you're on a ship at sea. And then if you go another six degrees beyond that, it takes about an hour and a half to get here, is 18 degrees below the horizon. This is what we call astronomical twilight. And by that time, it's really dark. And so astronomers and telescopes and those kind of people that do research in the night sky wait for the sun to get 18 degrees below the horizon before they can actually start their work and start looking at the night sky. So uh, tonight, just to review, uh, we'll do our program. We'll close close to eight o'clock. The best thing to do tonight would probably be just go out and look at this particular part of the sky, the western part of the sky, see if you can find Venus, See if you can find uh, and say goodbye to Sirius, the brightest star in the sky. See if you can find Mercury and Mars. Mars will be dimmer, but it'll be up there. We're going to talk a little bit more about those planets. We're going to see them from a space view when we come back from our break. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the moon and an eclipse when we get back. So thank you. And uh, I'm just going to take a little break. I'm going to close this out. It's always a little clumsy in this program because I have to go to Zoom and then stop share. And, um, and now I'm back. So I'm going to turn the, uh, turn the uh, polling questions over to Spruti and, uh, and we'll see where we go from there. Thanks. Thanks, Rick. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and launch the polls. Um, there you go. You should see it on your screens. So tonight we're asking how many virtual night sky shows have you attended since it's our anniversary? We want to know how many you attended and where are you viewing these from? So go ahead and cast your votes uh, while we take some questions. Alex? Oh, thanks, Boo. Yeah, we have a couple questions. Um, the first one is asked by Nadine. She asked, what was the second twilight called? That's um, nautical twilight. It's after civil and before astronomical. And then Mary asked, what exactly constitutes sunset? Um, this is a good question. So it's actually the part of the um, 
when the sun, the very top portion of it, drops below the horizon. So when there's no more um, visible sun on the horizon, that constitutes sunset. Um, you know, if you have mountains, it can kind of vary, but it's whenever there's no more sun in the actual sky. There's still light because um, there's still light from the sun reaching us through our atmosphere. But when that actual orb of light drops below the horizon, that is then sunset. So both very good questions. All right, thank you. Um, I'm going to share the results with you really quickly. So uh, in the first one, uh, we have a lot of um, people who've already seen a, a more than a ton of our virtual webinars, so that's great. And there's a lot of people who are here for the first time too, so welcome. And most of you from Arizona, and that's great. And But we also do have um, people all over the United States and some even from outside the US, so that's great. So back to you, Rich. Thank you, that was a quick, uh, that was a quick break. <laughs> yeah, so I know at least of two people out of the United States that watch the program, but I'm glad that there's six, so that's good. And then sometimes um, people ask a question of us is whether it makes any sense. I mean, we're broadcasting from Arizona. We're looking at a night sky. I'm telling you all the time that this is the night sky we see above our city right now. <clears throat> And does it make any sense for somebody to tune in from Indianapolis or, or Chicago or some other place? And, and people do, and that's okay. And so, so star-wise, the, the same stars appear uh, across the entire United States. So you're going to have your sunset wherever you are. And the stars that I'm talking about are going to be in your sky right after your sunset. And so it doesn't really matter. Uh, you'll just be sort of out of sync, right? So we're starting at seven here. That's going to be 10 o'clock back east. And so um, your sunset would have been a lot earlier than here. But it's still there. The reference to the stars, the reference to the constellations, all of that stuff is, is um, essentially viable wherever you are in the United States. Tonight, you're going to hear in a bit, not to start with, but when we start talking about the lunar eclipse, it actually does make a difference uh, because eclipses are uh, very short term events. Uh, it does matter where you on the on the earth and how you see an eclipse. And Alex and I are going to talk to you about that in a minute. Before we get there, I'm just going to launch another little thing here. Sorry, I'm looking way off to my side here, but I'm going to share a screen and uh, it's going to be a view of the sunset. This particular program I'm using here is uh, is called Digital Sky 2, DS2 is what we call it. And it was developed by a company called Skyscan. And it is uh, the, um, uh, the Oops, let me get this little arrow out of the way. Uh, it is the program that we use in the Marston Theater. And so what's special about the Marston Theater is the things that I'm showing you tonight, you actually see them in 3D. So planets kind of like come off the screen. Look at it. We can't do that. That technology doesn't work here in our, uh, in our format, but, but we can sort of show you some things that are going on up here. And I apologize in advance. It's a little bit jerky. I'm going to try to be very slow and sort of gradual about how I do it. But it just, it's a really, really big program. It's re-imaging um, and re-rendering all of this data every time I make a move. So, so uh, it'll, it, it'll, it'll do it for us what we need to do. Um, what you see here on the screen is, of course, our solar system. This is sort of uh, the, the, the you, you remember this particular map. And if you watch what I do, I do this little thing. I like to call it Planet Watch. I'm going to just show you where the planets are in their orbits, and then I'm going to show you what we get to see at home. And so that'll be the first part of the session, and then we'll talk a bit about what the moon is doing in its orbit, and then why it's going to cause an eclipse um, next week, and then Alex will tell you how to see it and, and how to find it and all of that stuff. So I'm just going to bring up, um, I'm sizing up the planets so you can see them a little bit better. I'm going to move in a little bit closer, and you can see this blue ring, the third uh, object from the sun, the third rock from the sun, right? You guys have heard that, that show before. Uh, uh, that's going to be the planet Earth. And I'm going to try to line this up in just such a way so that you can see the Earth, Mercury, Venus, and Mars off in the distance. And I'm going to, uh, I've got the wrong date here. Hang on just one second. I'm going to make a quick little, I just want to show you what this looks like right here, right now tonight. I've been on this theme of showing you uh, um, uh, tonight at eight o'clock. And so this is what all the planets are going to be doing at eight o'clock tonight. So you see the earth in the foreground. 
you can see Mercury is the is is kind of closest to the Earth. Um, Venus is in the background over there. Let me get a little tiny bit closer so we can sort of see what that looks like. And you see the Sun in the middle of this particular screen. So Sun. Venus, Mercury, and Mars. Now, importantly right now, just for this particular view, Venus is moving this direction in its orbit. So it's actually heading this way. Mercury is moving this direction in its orbit. So it's kind of heading this way. And I'm going to show you in your night sky from my driveway what you can actually see happening. So again, Venus will be closest to the sun when we start our view. Mercury will be just a little bit above Venus in the night sky. And Mars will be well above both of those in the night sky. Just so you can imagine the sun just below the horizon at our civil twilight. Uh, uh, Venus, Mercury, and Mars. You sort of get that picture? Okay, let me do this. I'm going to just sort of show you now. I'm going to take you to a view from my house. Uh, I'm in my driveway. That's the house across the street from me. That's Marcin's house. And you can see here, right, just as I described, here's Venus. And the sun is way down below the horizon here, six degrees below the horizon. So it's dark enough to see this now. So here's Venus. Here's the planet Mercury. And here's the planet Mars up way, way up high in the night sky. So you see that. So you see how that relates. I'm just going to go back again. So here's what's happening in space. Sun, Venus, Mercury, Mars in that order. Here's what's happening in my front yard tonight at eight o'clock. Uh, uh, sun is below the horizon, Venus, Mercury, and Mars are above the horizon. Does that make sense? Now, when I was putting this screen together today, I accidentally left all the planets at their full size. Let me just show you this. I think it's really, really, it, I, when I looked at it, I thought it's super cool. So here's right what I was showing you up in space. You've got the orbits of the planets because my planetarium has the lines. I can make the planets any size I want so you can see them and all that stuff. But, but here's what it would look like. Can you imagine if you walked out into your front yard and these planets were like supersized and you could see their orbits and all that stuff? That would be really, really super cool. We can't do that. But you can sort of know in your mind's eye what's going on in space and then what we get to see um, on, on, on our planet. It on uh, right there from my front yard. So there you are. Okay, now I'm going to move you forward in time. Something to look forward to. So if you keep watching this scene every night, it changes a lot. So um, nine days from now, it's a, a week from Friday. So Friday the 28th, uh, uh, Venus and Mars, I'm sorry, Venus and Mercury are, are going to be stacked right on top of each other. Let me sort of see if I can pull that scene up. There it is. So Venus is moving up away from the sun, getting higher in the horizon. Mercury, remember I said it was going the other direction? Remember how we were doing that in space? Venus going one way, Mercury going the other way, and they're going to meet a week from Friday. So check that out or just watch them as they get closer together night after night after night and then you can see them connect. Mars will just keep getting higher and higher in the sky. So it was here. It's just going to keep moving. This is Gemini, the twins. Mars is going to head in this direction, get dimmer and dimmer and dimmer and dimmer as it, as it goes in that direction. Uh, when we meet next... <clears throat> Right, uh, we're going to uh, uh, have our program on June the second, so two weeks from tonight. Let me just show you what that looks like. In to, by that time, Venus and Mercury have completely changed positions. So remember how Venus was close to the horizon and Mercury was above. By the time we meet again two weeks from now, Venus will be much much higher in the sky, and Mercury will be uh, just above the horizon. In fact, I'm guessing that Mercury is dim enough that we'll probably probably lose it by then. The sun won't be, that part of the sky won't be dim enough in civil twilight to actually make that happen. And look at Mars. Soon after this particular night, it will be just sort of like even with the the, uh, the uh, twins, uh, Castor and Pollux, Jim and the stars of Jim and I right here. So that's happening in, uh, in your night sky. And those are things to look at. And so now you've seen uh, how that looks in space. 
Let me turn off all these little sort of image things and get you back out into space. Um, the next thing I want to do is I have to kind of restore the size of the planets. I'm going to go sort of back, oops, go back a little bit and get close to the Earth. And we're going to look at the Earth-Moon relationship for a second, because I'm going to just describe to you what happens in space to make an eclipse happen. And so let me turn that off for a moment. I'm going to put an Earth label up so you can see where that is. Let's get a little closer so we can see. Oops. And uh, then I'm also going to uh, uh, do a little moon label so you can see where that is. And hang on just a second. Oh, I know what I need to do is I have to center on the earth. Sorry, this is a little chunky. I'm going from a, a solar system sun view um, uh, to an earth moon view. And it's just taking a little bit of chance to get here. It's very, very different. All righty, so there's the Earth, there's the Moon. I am actually going to uh, change the sizes just a little bit so you can see them. I don't like to do this too much because, well, they're not uh, oversized, but sometimes it's really, really difficult to see them um, if we don't. So now you can sort of see, here's the Moon, here's the Earth. The circle on the, uh, the screen is the orbit of the Moon. Now I'm going to add another little device here. Let me just sort of like just put a little plane up here and explain to you what's going on. So what I've added to the screen is literally a flat screen kind of plane, and it describes the plane of the ecliptic. So the Earth and the other planets orbit very, very flat, right? I mean, you know your solar system is flat. Uh, that is kind of what we call the plane of the ecliptic. And some planets are a little bit above or below or sort of like tilted a little bit. It's more like stacked dirty plates than a solid system. But uh, that gray uh, line right there you can see is, is basically the Earth-Sun relationship. The orbit of the moon actually takes it above the plane of the ecliptic for part of its travel and then below the plane of the ecliptic for other parts of its travel. You see that there? So I can sort of show you. So the moon can be below the plane. The moon can be above the plane. When it meets the plane going in this particular direction and crosses in, we call that a node and we call that the descending node. It's going to pass under the plane and into the lower part. When it comes up again out the other side, that's called the ascending node and it will come up, up, up above the plane. Let me just move the, the, the moon forward for you just a couple months just so you can sort of see it move. There you go. So you see it rides above the plane for a little bit, and then it rides below the plane for a little bit. And, uh, and that's how that works. So I'm going to go uh, to the full moon, not the one that's next week, but the one that was last month. <clears throat> Last month on um, uh, April the 26th, there was a full moon. To have an eclipse, two things have to happen. Number one, there has to be a full moon. And the full moon happens when the moon, the earth, and the sun are in alignment. Can you see on the screen here how that's working, right? So the sun um, and the earth and the moon are all in a line. And that means that the solar light is going by the earth. We're on the dark side looking at the moon and we see the full face of the moon in the sky. But we'll look where the moon is in its orbit. Here it is still above the plane of the ecliptic. And so that means they don't align exactly. It's not like the shadow of the earth is going to fall on the moon just because it's not exactly in line. It would have to be over here in order for that to happen. The moon would have to be in one of those locations where it's at a node, either descending or ascending. And it would sort of from there, if it is a full moon, that's when we have the eclipse. Let me just move forward to uh, the full moon that is next week. <clears throat> here it goes. You see there, look at that. So next week, let me just sort of realign here. So now you can see here's the full moon condition again. Remember, sun, earth, and moon. And you can see that the moon is actually straddling that line of the ecliptic. It's moving from the top to the bottom. And that means that the conditions are right. Two things happening. The alignment that makes the full moon, that's one thing. And then the moon at node, 
that has to happen as well. And that's why tomorrow or next week on uh, May the 26th, we will have a full lunar eclipse. I am going to stop share. I'm going to turn the microphone and the program over to Alex Blanche. And he's going to show you not only a resource you can find on your computer to sort of see how this is, what you're going to view and how that's going to work, but some other facts and timings and all that stuff about watching the lunar eclipse next week. Okay, Alex, take her away. Thank you, Rick. Yeah, I have a great resource for everybody. Um, Hang on, I forgot to have where my stop share button is. Okay, I'm done. There we go. There okay. Go. Let me um, share this real quick. Okay, so this is a website called timeanddate.com. This is a great resource for a lot of time zones and stuff, but it's also a great resource for eclipses and a lot of other uh, sun and moon phenomena. So actually, this is kind of the main web page. Just go to timeanddate.com. And if you look under sun and moon, you can actually see we have eclipses right here. If we click on that, you can actually see here's the May 26th total lunar eclipse. And so looking at this, this actually gives you a lot of good information. It gives you a countdown um, it gives you kind of locations and also it gives you a map. And so what we can do is we can actually go and look at like Phoenix and we can get a good idea of what it's going to look like in Phoenix. We can look at the timings and everything. Um, so this is going to be at about 1.42 a.m. right now. And then as we slowly progress, you're going to see the moon enter what's called the prenumbra, and we can, I can actually show a little diagram after that of what that is, and you can start to see it. Basically, this is the beginning of the eclipse, but really it's a part of the Earth's shadow that doesn't really um, isn't very powerful, so it just kind of dims the moon a little bit, and then you start getting into the umbra. So you can see these rings, and this is where the partial eclipse is, and so now you can see the moon gets dark, and then you're going to reach the total eclipse. Around this area, you're going to reach the peak. And this is where kind of the real lunar eclipse, where you're going to see this total eclipse happen when it's completely within the Earth's umbra. And then you can see it move back out. And so that's going to be, this is around, the peak's going to be around, as you can see, about 419, 420 AM, in, at least in Phoenix. You can see the countdown. You can see all these directions and positions. And so this is a really good resource to kind of find out where specifically um, you need to be to look at this eclipse. And actually, here's a full map of this total lunar eclipse. You can see this kind of dark red section in the middle is where the entire eclipse will be visible. But even this uh, lighter band here, all of the total eclipse will still be visible. Um, so this is because the difference between the entire eclipse and um, the, all of the total eclipse is that we don't get to see the end of the partial eclipse. Uh, the moon sets before that, so we don't get to see the end of the partial, but really you're not missing much, in my opinion at least. But if you're in this area of the United States, you're still getting um, all of the total eclipse. Beyond that, you're only getting partial uh, total or even just partial uh, viewing of the partial eclipse. And then beyond this area, so if you're some of our international audience, um, if, they're, if you're viewing from outside the United States, you might not be able to see the eclipse at all. So this is a really good area, a uh, good resource to find out where you can find the eclipse, where you can see it, and also um, what time you might be able to see it. But then talking more about like the actual dynamics of the lunar eclipse, this is a great diagram that showcases it. Um, this is the sun-earth-moon relation, not to scale. They're a lot farther apart, and the sun is a lot bigger. Um, but this is a, a good diagram that showcases what really happens. So the partial eclipse is when the moon enters the penumbra of the of the earth and even though these shadows kind of look like a kind of pentagon or not pentagons but like trapezoids um they're more of a cone so as you the moon enters this cone orbiting in um this is where the pre number is and this is where you start getting that partial eclipse not much will visibly change to the human eye but once you enter the cone of the umbra which is the other shadow produced by the earth that is where it becomes that dark um red and very hard to see and that's really where the, the total eclipse is and then it moves out of that area out of the umbra and then out of the print umbra, and then the eclipse is done so the eclipse really only occurs when the moon has a chance to pass in the shadow and the only reason this doesn't happen all the time is because um the relationship between the sun earth and moon the moon doesn't always orbit uh, perfectly in line with how the earth orbits the sun so sometimes it'll orbit uh, below or above this sh shadow it kind of orbits in a little bit of an angle angular path so um this is kind of the dynamics of the eclipse and you know this also has a great resource what is a total lunar eclipse so this uh, time and date website has a lot of good information uh, if you're not in phoenix or you want to check out your own location i highly recommend using it 
um, because it gives you a lot of good information and it'll give you even this uh, neat view about what you can see and when and kind of the position and everything. So great resource. Check it out. May 26th, early morning. Um, if you're on this map and make sure to make sure to view that if you are going to get up early enough. Thanks, Alex. So Alex and I actually had a conversation about this a couple of days ago, and I said, I'm going to get up. Of course I will. I'm going to go check it out. I might not stay out there for three or four hours. But uh, and then uh, Alex said, no, maybe not. I don't know. It's early in the morning. So what are you going to do? Are you, well, uh, are you interested enough to go check it out? You know, it's it's always a, a a special thing in eclipse, but I have seen a lot of lunar eclipses in the past, and there <laughs> there will be one. There there are three more this year. I, actually, and I, I know. So, um, you know, I might get up early. I actually might be uh, I might be up that early, but uh, I might not set an alarm for it. So we'll see. Um, but it is, I can I'm, understand. I'm going to be counting on a high percentage of our audience to actually get up really, really early in the morning. Mm -hmm. And the weather is really good for this right now. And this time of yes. year, it's really dry. So last time there was this kind of eclipse, it was a little bit misty, cloudy, and some of it was obscured and we couldn't see it. And so I, I, I'm going to just abdicate. This is one of the good ones and you should see it. Yeah. Now, If you haven't be, seen a total one before, definitely go out and see this one. If you haven't seen one before, go out. If you've seen a partial, still go out. They're really neat. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I recommend it heavily. This full moon is called the flower moon. And uh, the other thing is just the, the mysterious, just sort of orangey red color that happens when it's total. It's right. It's just something it's hard to describe. You really do have to go, go see it and you'll, you'll find it. And uh, Alex, I think I'll just call you at about 3.15 in the morning. So get out. Yeah, you get do out, that. Get yeah. out there. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. We'll, we'll try it. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. And so it's time for our second little break, some question and answers and another polling session. And then we'll be back with another part of the program. Thanks, Alex. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Rick. Okay, so time for the second poll. Just a minute to go ahead and launch it. And there we go. So um, if you were listening to Alex, uh, you'll be able to answer the second question. And then, so let me just read them out real quick. Will you be up to see the total lunar eclipse um, on May the 26th? And how many eclipses will you be able to see in 2021? So go ahead and cast your votes while Alex will take some questions. Alex? Yes. So we have a few questions regarding the eclipse. And then we have one from Steve, uh, who asks, is our solar system orbiting in a somewhat perpendicular angle in relation to the center of our galaxy? So this is more our solar system orbiting around the center of our Milky Way. Um, our solar system doesn't necessarily orbit perpendicular to the galaxy. It kind of orbits in this wave motion, actually, but it's pretty in line with the disk of our galaxy. But the planets orbit kind of perpendicular galaxy. So if this is the galactic plane, if this is the disk of the Milky Way, all the planets kind of orbit like this. We kind of got this oblique angle that that's what the planets orbit on. But the sun and that system goes around in kind of a pretty wave motion in the disk. So um, not exactly. It's more of the planets that do that. And then um, Mary asks, does the moon set before the sun starts coming up or does moon set and sunrise happen simultaneously? Um, that's a good question. Um, it can occur simultaneously if during the sunrise, sunrise time, you have a completely full moon, because that is when basically the moon and the sun are directly in line with each other. So that can happen. It's very rare for it to happen. A lot of times the sun will set before or after the moon rises or sets. Um, you can actually see that sometimes we have the moon during the day and the sun is up, but the moon hasn't set yet. So it's all dependent on the angle between um, this moon, the earth and the sun. Um, it's very rare. I don't think I've ever really encountered anything like that, but it can happen. Good questions, both. All right. I'm going to share the results. I have to and say, I'm really, really proud of our audience. It looks like 70% of you are going to get up in the middle of the night on Wednesday, you know, the 26th. And um, okay, I'll let I'll, I'll let Alex sleep, but the rest of us will get up. <laughs> and we'll just tell him about it next week after that. Yeah, everyone will have to take pictures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good to know. And most of you are listening to Alex too. So yeah, you got the right answer. Four is the number of eclipses that you'll be able to see in 2021. So good job, everyone. Thanks. I'm going to elaborate a little bit on what Alex was saying about the sunrise, moon, moon, moonrise. Yeah, in, indeed, the moon goes through its phases every 28 days. And, and yeah, kind of by definition, if you sort of just think of yourself sitting on the earth, 
pointing to the sun, pointing to the moon during a full moon, uh, those are going to be sort of opposite each other. So there, there is a generally, yes, that would be a good, good, good thing to say. Full moon is a time when it's close to sunset is is close to moonrise. The difference is, is that the moon is tilted on the plane, so it rises a little bit higher in the eastern horizon than the sun sets in the western horizon sometimes and those kinds of things. So it's off a little bit, but, uh, but yeah. And then uh, think about a half moon. The first half moon is going to be directly over your head at sunrise or sunset. And the third half moon, uh, the third quarter, the half moon, uh, the waning half moon will be directly overhead at sunrise. And so, so that there is a relationship there, sort of like the ups and downs in relationship, but that's a really good question to ask. All right. Um, now uh, I've got, um, <clears throat> we've been using our program. We've kind of developed these ideas that we're going to try to touch on every week. One of them is resources. And the next one is kind of current and coming events and things like that. And so I'm going to turn it back over to, to the team to kind of talk about some current event things going on. Right. Thank you, Rick. Um, I'm going to go ahead and count, um, share my screen really quickly. Just give me a second. There we go. Okay. So current events. So recently, um, a Chinese um, mission, Tianwen-1, um, launched um, and it, it, it includes a, a rover called the Zurong rover and um, it landed on Mars on May 14th and uh, it sent its first photos uh, back on May 15th and 16th, so 16th in China. And um, Zurong rover is essentially, um, it, it's going to um, find out more about this particular area on uh, Mars, which is the Utopia Planitia. So, um, there you see, um, it's pretty close to Perseverance. Um, although Perseverance is close to um, like a, an ancient river delta, um, a lot of that area has um, has shown potential of um, the ice icy layers beneath the surface. So Zurong will probably um, find out more about um, the icy layer beneath um, the surface. And um, here are some more um, things that the rover will try to find out like atmospheric sampling and the geology of the um, Utopia Planitia, um, um, the, it's the plane. And um, we hope to find more information and more data about uh, this particular icy um, layer beneath the crust of Mars and a lot about the atmosphere sampling and a lot about uh, Mars's magnetic field as well. So um, Turong is um, all out there along with Perseverance and all the other rovers and we hope to get more data from uh, another um, amazing technology, piece of technology uh, on Mars. And uh, along with this, um, a nice thing for everyone to go check out is the Psyche Inspired Online Showcase. So as we have mentioned in our programs before, Psyche is um, a mission to an asteroid, which is um, which we think is uh, completely composed of metal. We're gonna confirm it with uh, a mission to the asteroid. and. Um, a lot of our graduate students got together and created um, a lot of content, artistic content um, in relation to Psyche and the mission. So it includes these and um, Snapchat filters and a whole lot of creative content that they have uh, made. And it is available for you to see uh, from uh, up, up until the 24th of May. So be sure to check it out. Uh, the link will be posted in the chat. Um, so go ahead and um, check these two amazing things out. For more current events, uh, I'm gonna ask Kim to take over and she will let you know what else is going on. Thanks, Boutique. Um, so I just wanna share one um, mission coming up. Um, it's the Luna map and it is um, a CubeSat that's about the size of a shoebox. And it's the first ASU led NASA mission and it has been designed and built on the Tempe campus and Professor Craig Hargrove is the lead um, principal investigator. It's going to be um, shipping out this summer to Kennedy Space Station in um, Florida. And it's one of 13 CubeSats that will be on the launch and it will be launching later this year on the SLS Artemis 1. And also just wanna share that um, there's a 
podcast that we have going on with Katie Coleman, who's our ASU Global Explorer in Residence, and it's called Mission Interplanetary. And I'll put the link to that there in the chat when I'm done sharing out all these events. Um, so it's really interesting and we encourage you to, um, to check it out. And then lastly, um, we are partnered with the Arizona Historical Society and they um, are opening a space exhibit that starts tomorrow in Tucson and it's called um, Ready to Launch um, Arizona's Place in Space and there's a lot of um, pieces from ASU that are going to be on um, exhibit there. So if you have a chance and you're interested in seeing that, it's down in Tucson and I would recommend um, maybe checking it out if you're looking for something to do on the weekend. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to my colleague Meg and she's going to come on and say a few words. Good evening, everyone. And welcome. I'm very pleased to break in with a great announcement that today, um, in addition to celebrating one year anniversary, uh, we also want to celebrate a big happy birthday to our presenter, Rick. Rick Alling celebrates his birthday today, and we just wanted to break in uh, and we hope that you'll join us in wishing him the best. We hope you'll stay up late enough to check out the, uh, uh, the eclipse and maybe uh, raise a cup of cocoa up to Rick as you do that. And we're so pleased that you join us continue. We hope you'll continue to join us because uh, there's so much to see, so much to learn, so much to celebrate. So Rick, a very, very happy birthday from us and from your audience. The fan club continues to grow. Very happy birthday to you. Um, maybe we'll curtail the singing, but it is very sincere wishes to you, <laughs> our Thank friend you. and colleague. Happy birthday. Thank you for I think anyone wants to hear me Happy sing. Birthday, Rick. Happy birthday. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. I uh, I really appreciate that. It's uh it's it's been just uh, it's just been a great year. Uh, I don't think when we started this, we really knew it was going to take. You know, it was going to last. It was going to take a year. Um, so I I, so I think I'm uh, more celebrating the anniversary of the virtual night skies. <clears throat> and its continuing success and continuing programming in the future. Uh, I'll always have another birthday, I, I suppose. And so, uh, so uh, and there's also, of course, there's an astronomical connection there. And of course, the sun and I have gone around, or I've gone around the sun one more time since I was born. And, uh, and uh, I appreciate your sentiments. Look at that. And, uh, well, we love the symmetry of tonight's presentation. And so we just wanted to uh, include this very important news uh, break with everything. So thank, thank you. you so much to our audience, Rick. Thanks so much uh, to, and to our team as well. Happy birthday, friend and colleague. Thank you. All right, in celebration of that, I wanna show you guys one more thing here. And, and uh, uh, we've got just a couple minutes before we go, but I, I, I kind of put together several years ago, I put together this idea that there are ways that we can as as people the living in the world today and our in our rushed and, and hectic lives, there's ways that we can stay connected to the night sky. And so I call it the five things. And I'm going to just walk you through five things that we should do. And I'm saying we should all do this. We should all sort of like connect. I'm talking to the choir here because I know you uh, are participating in the virtual night skies. You're interested in this. And so, so let me just sort of share with you, if, if, if I can, uh, the five things. <clears throat> Um, and, uh, you know, part of this uh, came, uh, this was after a whole lecture that I used to to do, and I'll do it again, just sort of about how time has changed. We used to connect time to the movement of the sun and planets, and now we have watches and clocks and schedules and all that kind of stuff. And, and I think it's moving us away from the things we should do. So I got five things. Uh, number one is get to know and visit a constellation annually. I think uh, you, we are doing that, right, in this particular program. What did I do? I showed you some constellations tonight. Um, so I'm going to ask you to find one, pick one, adopt one. Uh, and it can be one of the ancient Greek constellations. It could be a native or an indigenous constellation. It could be one you make up. It could be uh, your grandfather's DeSoto, for all I care, to sort of find a pattern of stars in the sky and get to know it, own it, and watch it come back every year. And, and celebrate that. And, and you could do it, you could set it up at a time, it could be your birthday, it could be your anniversary, it could be the time that your family reunion out on the lake in the Ozarks happens every year at the same time. Whatever that is, make it annual, make it a celebration, make it your constellation, and just make sure that you visit it once a year. 
And I think that's really, that's, that's kind of important. That connects you to that cycle of the earth around the sun. Uh, next, uh, this is relevant tonight. Uh, take advantage of periodic things that happen. There's an eclipse next week. Have you heard about it? Yeah, of course you did. And we asked you if you're going to get up at 3.30 or 4 in the morning. And you said, yeah, you are. So now you know what's making that of that strange phenomenon happen. And now you're going to work, you're going to actually do something, you're going to invest in making sure you do that. So it could be meteor showers, it could be eclipses, it could be comets, comets are amazing, because they're so periodic, and we never really know when you're going to have another great comet. But when those things happen, learn about them, go find them, seek them out, and do it. So just just make it happen. So, so in the annual sense, you're connected to the movement of the earth around the sun. When you go look at something like this, then you're connected with something on a much, much bigger cycle, sometimes thousands and thousands of year cycles that happen to us periodically. Number three is you should change your habits a little bit seasonally. And I do it in exercise. So in the certain times of year, I ride my Peloton more and certain times of year I run more and I swim more sometimes of the year. That's, that's a cycle. That means you're doing something different. And one of the things I invite people to do is eat differently. So, and, and an easy way to do this is there's thousands of farmer's markets that are opening up. If you've noticed around the valley, there's a farmer's market. Just, just go find something at a farmer's market and eat something. Put something in your body that grew under the sun within days, right? We don't have to do that, right? We have frozen foods and we have fast foods and we have these foods that are prepared for us and all that kind of stuff. But you know, your body actually wants you to eat something that grew under the sun this week. And so, so make sure you do that. Actually, it's part of your DNA. It's actually in your cell structure. And so this is really an important thing to do. So, so what are we doing? We're kind of looking for a constellation. We're watching a seasonal cycle. We're at, at, at making available to ourselves these, these, these strange phenomena that happen periodically. And we're changing a little bit of our lifestyle to make sure that we're, our body, our, 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 our uh, task, our toils, and what we do and how we participate in the world uh, do this seasonally as well. So that's really kind of important. If you are religious at all, your liturgical cycle is part of the system. So you do different things at church, uh, different times a year, you have different feasts, you have different things. It's all part of that system and it's in us and it's, uh, it's part of us. Number four, we've talked about this on this program before, but be an advocate for dark skies. Make sure that you're sort of connected to the movement that is trying to sort of organize cities and communities to savor their sky. Uh, we had a show on this particular program uh, several months ago where we were celebrating Fountain Hills, a suburb of Arizona, and they became one of the most recent international dark sky communities uh, that exist. And so that's important. Flagstaff, Arizona was the first dark sky community. They did it out of necessity because low observatories up there and the city lights were taking over the night sky. They figured out a way to do it. They made it happen. It's now part of their system. And, and the, the skies above Flagstaff are beautiful even today. But if we're going to do anything about keeping connected and keeping uh, organized and keeping attached to the sky, we're going to have to have a sky to look at. And so, so do, do this. Try to learn about these things. Be an advocate. And, and go down to your city council and say you want to do this. And follow uh, these things as we go forward. There's, there's websites about international dark sky movement and what it means and all that stuff. And it's easy. It's, it's it's actually, it saves money. It's not a cost thing. It's not a big, huge burdensome thing. It's just a way to design lighting so that it's better for your sky. And that means all these other things. So the last thing I want to do, do number five, I think might be the most important and might be the easiest one to do. Uh, what I need you to do is do all of these things, do all of them one through four, uh, but do these with a child. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. And thank you very much for uh, helping us with our celebration, both my birthday, my heartfelt thanks for that, but also the anniversary of Virtual Night Skies. And we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you.